awareness, the what you could call an epistemic space, a space of knowing, or, or at least I, I think actually believing is a better term. The, the fact that we are capable of, you could say, simulating a world around us or conjuring this, um, you had a something you, were, you referred to as a glassy simulacrum, which I really liked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it's that idea of a simulacrum, it's, a sim it's something conjured, basically, um, that is kind of ephemeral. So that's what we're dealing with the contents of, of experience is this kind of believing in this world that isn't actually appear, it doesn't actually exist the way it appears to me now. So I offer an mm -hmm. account of why I think the physics of life ent entails that we do that, that all living things have to do that basically in order to survive. If you just, you mm -hmm. can't survive just on reflex. And welcome back to the Natural Awakening Podcast with me, your host, Wiston, and today's guest is Professor James. Well, Professor, that, that kind of implies that you're still employed. Doctor, yeah, Dr. James a Cook. Professor position. <laughs> yeah. No. no. Yeah. Thank you. That Neuroscientist me, and... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, I, I could I could introduce you, but why don't you uh, just give folks who are not familiar with you, yeah. though I imagine um, plenty will be, um, who you are, um, where you're coming from, you know, professionally, and also um, maybe a little bit personally. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so I am um, a neuroscientist by training, as in kind of um, research, like researching the brain and, and how kind of perception experience happens and... Uh, did that for over a decade at universities um, and have was always inspired by a kind of, I had a kind of awakening as a teenager, kind of classic Ken show uh, kind of situation. And I, but I, I'd grown up in a kind of Catholic community that I, the dogmatism and the, the metaphysical supernatural picture really bothered me, uh, which actually is what led to the awakening. Um, and so I, I was always, the thing that really struck me that was most salient given who I was, was how non-supernatural it was, how deeply kind of based in just, <laughs> the, it, was, it was about seeing truth, not about, you know, not like the truth as some fixed thing, but like it, it wasn't about some delusional extra, you know, thing. So uh, in my research, you know, this didn't really come in very explicitly, although I was, I was studying kind of how concepts form and things, because I kind of saw that as the mechanism that kind of asserts duality is, you know, dividing the world up into different perceived separate things. But then I, um, I hit upon a kind of solution to the relationship, as I see it, a solution to, between matter and consciousness, uh, you know, it's known as the hard problem of consciousness. And then I really, after, after that happened, there was this kind of like, oh, okay. Like I've scratched the itch of why I came into academia really. Um, I could keep going with the intellectual stuff, but actually the re the, the re sorry, I realized it was supposed to give you a quick summary of who I am, and now I'm going into my <laughs> whole life. No, story. no, no. I mean, that, that's, that, that, that's all part of it. Keep, okay, keep well, going. Will, it will do both at the same time. So, um, where was I? Yeah. So I, I realized that I wasn't in academia just to play intellectual games. I, I had this, this, it was part of a kind of, I guess, an ongoing awakening of, of facing reality, feeling into the truth of reality in our situation, um, in it. And, yeah, I'd, I'd kind of accidentally stumbled into to a, finding a picture, a metaphysical picture that that made sense to me, and at least gave me a sense of peace, and um, that I'd found something that I was looking for. And then I made the decision that I wasn't. I could, you know, I thought, well, I can just keep publishing papers and unpack the details of this. And um, but then I made a decision because I'm really what I'm really passionate about is that kind of, I guess, is about kind of awakening and um, uh, helping people come out of suffering. And so I thought, well, I'll, I'll move into kind of communication and, you know, focus on teaching kind of experiential side of things and using this metaphysical framework as hopefully a useful tool to help people soften into kind of surrender into reality. Uh, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not offering that people have to, again, I'm anti-dogma. So it's, it's, a, if it's useful to people, great. If it's, if it's not, then, then throw it away. But, um, so where I'm at now is, uh, left academia a couple of years ago and, I'm building a retreat center in Portugal, which is where I'm based now. Should be open 2025 for retreats, and I'm about to launch in a few weeks. Uh, a I have a website called InnerSpaceInstitute.org, and then through that there'll be a kind of uh, kind of like a kind of like a meditation app in, in a website uh, with the approach that I take to this stuff, uh, which is very based in, in science. And um, but yeah, that's very much the kind of 
practice side of things, which I've, I've not been focusing as much because I have a podcast, which is unpacking the the many aspects of this kind of worldview. You can see it, you know, from many many sides, and so I've I've had the kind of good fortune to speak with many thinkers I respect and to give them space to kind of unpack for my audience uh, their perspectives on different aspects of this this kind of thing that's come together as a synthesis, which I'm now publishing as a book called Dawn of Mind, which is out in December 2024. Uh, and yeah, that, that unpacks this this theory of consciousness, which is really fundamentally arguing that we've taken a wrong turn in thinking that consciousness has to be something that the kind of prototypical example of consciousness is is, is human consciousness and the human brain and, the, and the, it's human centered and the other things are conscious if they're, if they're kind of sufficiently similar to us. Like that's the way we typically think about it. Um, and what I'm, what I think the actual situation is is that consciousness didn't come into existence with brains or even nervous systems, but I think it came into existence with life, with being a kind of embodied feeling thing that feels its way through the world. Um, so this is more of an emergent view. You're not taking something like panpsychism or metaphysical idealism. Right. Um, so, yeah, yeah I, was, I was about to say that, yeah, the, um, but I'm not, so I do say like, I, the point of the book is really to make this claim of what's called biopsychism, that, that life and consciousness kind of go together. And in arguing that, that, you get into a whole bunch of problems if you try to restrict it within life to, to creatures like us with nervous systems. So I'm really focusing on fighting that battle, but I do make it clear in the book. I, I do dismiss, yeah, you know, I go through kind of idealism and panpsychism and I do say why I don't ascribe to them, but I do leave a question mark, like a, an openness to, to how you interpret this, because I really see it as a kind of synthesis of panpsychism, idealism, physicalism, uh, because they're all lenses. They're all ways of looking mm -hmm. at the true non-conceptual ground of, of reality, which doesn't have a name, doesn't have labels. And so- But in this form appears as form. human beings with senses that operate right. and- <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but then, so, so yeah, so the, the other part, the first part of the book is this unpacking what I've called non-dual naturalism, which is a way of talking about just naturalism being the kind of scientific philosophical urge to, to not have these supernatural explanations that are dis, there was some disjunction between our observable experience of reality you know, through science and then some kind of creator God or something that's just fundamentally separate. Um, but instead we expect everything to kind of hang together and be coherent, which I think fits nicely with non-duality because the idea of that as well is that we could say that reality is this coherent whole, uh, it's not actually fundamentally separated into different things. Um, so I think non-duality and naturalism go together really nicely. But yeah, so with non-dual spiritual kind of experiences, there is this deep sense that the self is an, you know, an appearance in consciousness. It's not the self that is conscious, right? It's an appearance. And so the consciousness, consciousness feels far more grounded, or you could say there can be a temptation to shift identity to it and say, that's what you are. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I try to be thorough with going beyond identity in terms of not, not settling. So I don't want to say consciousness and identity, but anyway, it feels more grounded and more real, more part of yeah, the ground of being, you could say. Uh, and so I, the, the picture I, I lay out is that I think that the core of, so the core of consciousness, you could say as awareness is kind of a formless, pristine space in which appearances arise. And so the for, the, the core of that formless awareness is formlessness is void is no thing. Um, sure. and so I think that's what the ground of being is. That's what the fundamental metaphysical kind of ontological primitive is, is you start with nothing. Um, and, and in your model, is that nothingness? Does it, I mean, and this is a debate within Buddhist traditions and also between, you know, Buddhist, Buddhist and non-Buddhist schools, for instance, um, you know, whether the, the formless ground, if, 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 if even that's the right framing, um, has an element of cognizance to it. Some traditions right. will say yes. And some will say, no, 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 that's an emergent property. Right. So, um, so what I, what I, at the moment where, where I'm at with it is you have a formless ground and then in that ground form arises as a kind of Taoist kind of like interplay between, between these, these opposites. And then it's it within form you get, I should probably just unpack the whole thing. So, you, so the, here's a, here's a story that I like to tell that, I, that kind of, you know, this is speculative metaphysics. So we need to take this lightly that this isn't provable and it's, you know, I'm just telling a story. It's a, bit, a nice but, bedtime story. Uh, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> imagine if you, if to, be, to have a truly naturalistic picture of the world where you're not positing something with, with no cause just for the sake of it, I mean, start with that, truly nothing, absolute nothing. 
Um, and so what's the nature of, of absolute nothing? Well, there can't be limits, there can't be boundaries, there can't be anything finite that would block it in because then the, that wouldn't be nothing, that would be something there. So it's synonymous with unboundedness, which as I suggested there is the same thing as kind of non-finiteness. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a kind of like an infinite, you could say space, but that's an analogy. So you've got this kind of infinite nothingness and within a space of nothing, with, within an infinite space, anything that can happen will happen. And so it's a kind of, it's, it's also synonymous with potentiality. So you get from kind mm -hmm. of nothing to infinity to potentiality. And so, okay, you've got this potential, this potentiality. And then what kinds of things could happen within this ground of nothingness? Well, you couldn't just have something solid, stable, permanent that lasts forever. That just wouldn't, again, make sense. But you could perhaps have events, occurrences, fluctuations that are impermanent, that arise and pass away continually. And so that's where I think you get form. And we see this marrying up with physics where you know, uh, Carlo Rovelli, the physicist, published a book a couple of years ago now, maybe last year, called Helgoland, where he- suggests, Very worth reading. I recommend anyone in the audience, go read it. It's a great book. So yeah, he's, he's suggesting, I mean, it has been suggested, I think basically the same thing by people like Fritjof Capra, who are basically ostracized in some sense from mainstream uh, uh, science for being too spiritual, but he, he's basically restating this, this relational view of quantum mechanics, of, of kind of fundamental physics, of saying that actually, there aren't separate things. There's only the whole interacting with itself. Uh, so relating to itself, interdependence. Um, Indra's net is a good metaphor that crops right, up. So he actually, he says in the book how again and again in talks, people were like, have you read uh, Nagarjuna or Nagarjuna? I don't know which way you say it. And he kept dismissing as like, I don't want to read some Buddhist philosophy. <laughs> and then, uh, and then eventually he reads it and he's like, holy crap, this guy <laughs> like, came up with the same thing that I did. But um, he doesn't make the leap to, he kind of, almost the way that I read it gives the impression that like, well, if you're going to read every philosopher of all time, one of them's going to get lucky with a random guess rather than reckoning with the kind of... The <laughs> no, no, no. This, this comes out of is. phenomenological and exactly, you know, exactly. deep, you know, like both the scriptural tra tradition, but that in itself is based within the Buddhist tradition on like really deep yogic experience. <laughs> exactly, right. So, <laughs> like that, so that's where that comes I'm from. <laughs> yeah, in, in the book, in the Dawn of Mind, I'm, I'm kind of suggesting why it's why it totally makes sense that phenomenology should be able to give you some insight into the nature of, of being a la kind of Schopenhauer had this, you know, this mm -hmm. idea that mm -hmm. we are the kind of window onto the thing in itself. So, um, we are the yeah, thing in itself expressing. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So he had this like more kind of idealistic view, but, um, anyway, not to get lost in the weeds. So you have, um, this podcast is for the weeds. Of, Okay. <laughs> um, that that's the audience. Uh that, that that I mean that's what I'm here for as the host. So <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So um so yeah, this this question of uh, is the ground itself aware? Um so um you have you have form, this form is a process, it's a kind of impermanent flow. Um I can't really say flow is not not really time, but it, but let's just say you know it's like this 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 process this this relational thing timeless flux, and, which doesn't really make sense in yeah. conventional terms, but right that's a good way of saying it. Um, and so in the book, I, I unpack how the things that block us from seeing this is is our folk psychological intuitive notions that we're a solid stable self, we're separate from the world, but crucially here that substance, yeah, you know, we think that substance is something that we generalize from our parochial experience of the world that I like, I'm not passing through this chair right now. And so that feels like a solid thing. It feels like a material solid substance. And we generalize that to this, this very kind of this view of the world where like, oh, well, maybe it's made of these little atom building blocks that are solid, hard things, material. Right. Um, and so I'm, you know, I'm saying that the reason I don't pass through this chair is, you know, we're both almost empty, you know, almost entirely empty space, but it's to do with the physics. I don't pass through it. And then my I represent that as a relational property of I, my body can't move through this. That doesn't mean there's such a thing as a solid substance. It's a, it's a psychological event. So um, this takes you into a kind of insubstantialism or immateriality, but, but I, I think it's important to differentiate between, you know, people will then want to go, well, if it's not, if matter is not a hard material thing, then I'll say reality is mind because we really crave some solid substance. We don't. Well, if it's not matter, it must be mind. Yeah. Cause like the ego doesn't like, groundlessness it doesn't like yeah. emptiness really it, like it kind of wants to hold on to something um, there's one philosopher's term non-materialist physicalism physicalism as defined as so you know there's there's nothing exactly outside the I'm yeah arguing for exactly is that, that so to me physicalism is the stuff that's or the aspect of reality that's studied by physicists um 
is you could say experience depends on that. So if right. I ingest a psychedelic and it, you know, the, the molecules impact my brain and then the contents of my consciousness, consciousness change, I think that's a, that's a, it makes sense that that very, very normal common sense, typical view we have that ma that the mind depends on matter in that way. Um, if you give me brain damage physically, you know, because of the atoms of a hammer hitting the atoms of my brain and then my consciousness changes, we have to reckon with that relationship, which a lot of idealists kind of don't in my opinion, but, uh, or the way no. you're problematic. Um, oh, well, that's not the real mind. That's not the real consciousness though. The, the, the real thing is this pristine formless thing that is not affected right. by any, you know, perturbation of the brain meat. Um, well, okay. How about propofol, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but so, so yeah, so that's the, the really good, the, the juicy stuff is when you get into the formlessness. So, um, so to, to close this, this whole loop, um, I think that, so the, I think, I think that awareness, the, what you could call an epistemic space, a space of knowing, or, or at least I, I think actually believing is a better term. Like the fact that we are capable of, you could say, simulating a world around us or conjuring this, um, you had a, something you wrote, you referred to it as a glassy simulacrum, which I really liked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's that idea of a simulacrum, it's, a sim it's something conjured basically, um, that is kind of ephemeral. So that's what we're doing with the contents of, of experience is this kind of believing in this world that isn't actually appear. It doesn't actually exist the way it appears to me now. So I offer an mm -hmm. account of why I think the physics of life ent entails that we do that, that all living things have to do that basically in order to survive. If you just, you mm -hmm. can't survive just on reflex. It's actually really simple. Like if, you know, if you asked a kid, why does a bird see, it would probably give a simple answer to the world so it can eat worms. So it like doesn't get eaten by something else. But what it's really, what the kid's really saying is so it can survive. So it can keep doing the stuff yeah. that it does to survive. Um, and I think that that's basically true. Uh, and then, you know, people want to say, well, but surely, you know, that's just a series of mechanical events inside the organism. I can unpack in more detail while I think, why I think that is consciousness, but also an important aspect of that is that I don't reify consciousness or even awareness into a solid thing. I think they are also empty sure. in the sense that they arise. Um, they depend dependently arise with the rest of existence. So I think for us, awareness is a kind of a point of contact between organism and environment. Um, so I think if you, when I die, uh, the soup of chemicals here, uh, that doesn't have an inside and outside functionally in the way that's, you know, defines life, then I don't think there's any reason to there be awareness there. Now the caveat is the, the best formulation of this kind of these kinds of dynamics I'm describing is something called the free energy principle, which was initially mm -hmm. Carl developed to right. So that was initially developed well, first to explain predictive coding in the brain. Then he, he came in a different direction and showed you can get to the same insight through understanding self-organizing dynamics of living things. And then he, he kind of went on to kind of show that actually this is a kind of th he's had a paper very recently in a physics journal called like where it was about it being a theory of everything, even particles of kind of in physics and, and stuff like that. And there are, there are differences, but this, these, this way, this kind of statistical model way of looking at interacting things that kind of demarcate themselves as separate from other things, um, is extremely, uh, you can apply it very widely. So you want to apply it to a black hole or, you know, any thing that can be, can be statistically differentiated from its surroundings over time. So when you get into that, that's when I, I put a question mark and I say, I, I make an argument in the book that's very kind of pragmatic that like, um, look, I'm, a, I'm here having experience as a living thing. Like all of my experiences seem to be scaffolded on my living, my being a living thing. I feel certain ways about food and drink and sex and all this procreation, like all this biological based stuff. Yeah. Um, and so I don't, and a lot of that actually, I, I don't think it's, you can generalize it to say a rock because I don't think a rock is a, is an organized whole in this way that life is. So this is, there's a popular theory of consciousness called integrated information theory, which basically amounts to saying the extent to which a system is holistically integrated is what makes it conscious. I don't think that's true, but I, I, I've kind of brought it in to say, I well, mean, I under that theory, true. you know, a, a silicon board could at some point be right. conscious. Yeah. Right. But, but that thingness, the ability to say that is an integrated whole. I think that might be relevant to say that if you want to say that actually only like living things are aware, I think you might bring in that, which is why I do in the book and say that, that that is at least a prerequisite to be a thing that can be conscious. Um, I don't think things really exist that are truly really separate, but you're functioning as something that's kind of relatively defined from your environment. I don't think you can point to a river 
and say, is that thing conscious? Because a river, where are you drawing the boundaries? It doesn't itself assert any boundaries. So, um, so that's why I don't go into um, ideas and panpsychism as as my my stance. However, mm-hmm. because yeah, because basically you can't say there are uh, things there in the same way that you can at least make a kind of version of that claim for life. But and, and where do you draw that boundary? You know, because this is this is an issue like a demarcation or boundary problem. Um, where where is the boundary there between inside yeah. the skull and outside? You know, where how does consciousness maintain or form a boundary to begin with? Yeah, so that's the cool thing with the free entry principle is is you um, it describes um, it describes kind of self organization. You can look at it through these two lenses. Basically, you can say the maintain the the act, the kind of information processing dynamics that maintain a, a boundary. Well, the information processing dynamics bring into existence the body, basically. Or you could say being a body brings into existence these. They're just two sides of the same coin. They're two different lenses: physical organization and um, uh, and information processing. I'd like to unpack that a bit more, but I just want to make sure I close the gap on what mm-hmm. we were saying about um, about possibility of panpsychism and idealism. There's a guy called John Campbell who's written a lot about universal uh, Darwinism. It is kind of selection algorithms, you know, uh, apply at all levels, um, which I I think similarly. Uh, and he he ends up bringing it's basically saying the free energy principle really captures this. That when it re- when you really boil it down most complex forms, emergent forms of existence, perhaps all, are inferential processes, processes that are things that become like models fitting into a niche. So like evolution yeah. is, it's like a, a variation and select algorithm that, that fits organisms to their niche, like a giraffe having a long neck right, for eating leaves. But the same thing's true for our minds. We become like, we consciousness kind of, um, arises through this kind of selection algorithm of survival that keeps us coupled to our environment, that keeps us kind of engaging with it in this, in this kind of informational loop. Uh, and so in that picture, you go down to physics as well, and you've got similar dynamics playing out. So that's where I'm like, so I think he had a book called The Knowing Universe. And so that phrase captures where I put the question mark in terms of like, I've opened a door here to say, look, get rid of thinking about brains bringing consciousness into existence. Sure, they, they're part of this loop in us, and they're very important in us for this loop, but it doesn't mean that that they were the first, that they're the be one end or they're a part of the process. So if I can convince people of that, then the question is, well, okay, well, is it actually a knowing universe where perhaps the whole or perhaps certain dynamics within it, or maybe like uh, have this this aspect of um, this epistemic space we're calling awareness or consciousness, and then perhaps if you go all the way down, all forms, it is like a panpsychic vision where the flip side of being a materially organized thing is to have this, this no, this kind of information processing type epistemic behavior where you believe things about the world about you, which brings us back to what I, we were going to get into next, which is unpacking that, um, what we we're saying about boundaries and information and, and organization. Uh, so yeah, I think, I think you, but at this point, I feel like we're in, um, very speculative territory and the science should hopefully help. Um, <laughs> hopefully. So meaning kind of breaks down where you get. So I, I would say like the, the consciousness is a kind of complex relationality between organism and environment and physics is relationality. So you could say mm-hmm. physics is proto consciousness because, but we're using, we're just playing with the words here because we're saying physics. It's is certainly not consciousness in, in anything like the form that we like it's this. not experiential, <laughs> but it's it's the thing that become that like is continuous with consciousness in its form. Sure. So, so it's like, but then you're like, well, is it experiential? And then then you get well, what what? I, I mean, it sounds crazy when you because once you're familiar with this kind of stuff, there can be a period where you really feel like awareness is just the most rock solid thing in existence, and you, you really reify it. And I mean, you know, it's kind of yeah. You, you reify it right? as a as a kind of ultimate ground and identity, right. um, and that's a stage, <laughs> right, right, right. But um, yeah, it, it can. I don't know where I was going. I think just that it can feel like the. Um, I understand why people generalize that to, uh, right. That's what I was going to say. So that the the relationality of matter feels like if you want to project that experiential quality onto it but when when you feel that the experience is something you can really you really know where that awareness is but actually when you spend enough time with it and it starts to feel empty itself then you're like well what am i even saying it what what is what does it even mean to say that an atom is aware 
when I can't even really find awareness. <laughs> like after years and years of thinking, <laughs> awareness can find itself. Why are there fireworks? There are fireworks. <laughs> I have no idea. Well, I have no idea. I have never seen that before. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I don't know if that's the um, recording software or if that's going to show up in the in, in the video, but um, okay, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, Something in my head <laughs> so I that happened again. I, I don't know. Um, I've never seen that happen before. Can you release an audio version of this? Because if if you do, fireworks went off in my background. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, video and audio. So you know. yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, um, I'll ramble now if I if I keep going. <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean, we're we've covered a lot in in some depth uh, already. Um, I'm just gonna briefly look over. Um, you, you gave me kind of a, a pressy, if that's how you pronounce that word, right. of of the book. Um, yeah, I think I might have blitzed through a lot of it. Um, yeah, 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 you did. I start with the kind of folk psychological notion stuff, and then metaphysics. Uh, yeah, rejecting Buddhist idealism. I want to stand up for, for my Buddhist friends. You know, I, I am a Buddhist myself, you know, we're not all idealists. I'll have, you know, <laughs> that, that was a random <laughs> phrase I used to describe the account that you just described in terms of, um, formless awareness being the, the real thing, right? Not yeah, the sure. Which, which but some I, Buddhists I really, will put forth as a metaphysical thesis. Um, so and the, other the, the Buddhists will say, absolutely not. <laughs> right. The document I send you isn't part of the actual, I don't use that term in the book, but I didn't know what to call gotcha. it. Like, cause I actually don't see it very sure. as, in contemporary spirituality outside of Buddhist circles, like there's, there's a lot of um, Advaita kind of mm -hmm. Buddhism where people really reify the, the contents, the, qual the kind of quality you could say of consciousness as being the thing that's fundamental. Um, right. And so actually I wasn't sure if what term to use for that, the kind of formless awareness idealism. Um, but I don't know if you think that's yeah, I don't know. gesturing towards um, yeah, I mean, it's arguably, I mean, and this is kind of going further afield from the topic of, of, of the book and the interview, but, you know, are arguably some forms of Buddhism, like Yogacara, for instance, um, within the history of Buddhist philosophy is a form of metaphysical idealism. Um, or, you know, I think it's more profitably read as purely phenomenological and not making any claims about metaphysics at all. Um, right. But, you know, that's debatable. Um, both within the tradition and, you know, contemporary scholars disagree about what what did Vasubandhu really mean in this <laughs> in this verse? <laughs> um uh, hmm. uh, I mean, one thing within the Buddhist tradition that kind of ought to, in my opinion, put paid to, you know, this kind of, uh, cognizance or awareness in any sense that we would recognize as being fundamental is meditative states of cessation of awareness in early Buddhism and later Buddhism. It's really clear. There's this thing called Niroda Samapati, the, the attainment of cessation or Sanya Vedita Niroda, literally the cessation of perception and feeling. We're not talking about getting into an extremely dereified state of formless awareness here. Um, we're talking about lights out. <laughs> that's what it means. That's that's what it's lights out. <laughs> yeah, so um, that, that I agree that that kind of um, puts us back onto more sober, kind of simple ground, where it's like it makes it just it does just make sense if awareness is something relatively. I mean, it's just awareness. Like it's we we have to we talk about it and we point to it because it you know it's our, it's almost like a light guiding it. I mean, obviously it's like a light in terms of luminous experience, but it's like a guiding light in terms of our practice when you're first trying to, well, throughout many stages, right? You're trying to tune in, point to different aspects of the mind. But then in, in the kind of deep stages of this stuff, I really think, at least for me, everything becomes very ordinary in the sense where it's like, yeah, like I'm a, I'm an ape and I am a living thing and I have awareness <laughs> because that's functionally useful. Uh, sure. It's like a window onto the totality of existence and God or whatever you want to say. Uh, but like, even the like, whoa, that's cool has to fade eventually. And you're just left with like, yep, just chilling as a, <laughs> as a living thing. And nothing's actually special, but it's kind of you know, extraordinary mm -hmm. ordinariness, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, at the beginning, mountains are mountains and uh, right, right. waters are waters, rivers are rivers. I think it's rivers and river, rivers are rivers. In the beginning, mountains are not uh, in the, in the middle. Mountains are not mountains. <laughs> right, rivers right. are not rivers. <laughs> and in the end, mountains are once again, mountains and rivers are once again, rivers. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Extraordinary, ordinary. That's a that's a nice way of saying it. Yeah. And yeah, I'm curious. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we've we've gone through a lot of the philosophical and scientific content in kind of a blitz. Um, hopefully, that's comprehensible for folks. And if if not, I apologize. Um, <laughs> <laughs> go 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 follow James. Um, read the book. Um, and yeah. check out his I'll YouTube channel and website. Ad nauseum talking about this stuff, so it should it should be able to to get get it out. <laughs> But I am curious how, uh, you know, in your own personal practice, 
um, and, and history, how this all unfolded. I mean, I, I remember hearing for you yeah. that there was a Kensho experience in, in your teenage years, which I also had experiences of that, which were the reason for me to, you know, go throw myself in, into practice full time, um, yeah. for a while and thinking I was going to be a monk for a while. Um, so how did that, yeah. how did that unfold for you? If you're willing to, you know, divulge no, that here. To get into that. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so I, I was 13 and I was just on a bus ride. I was very um, preoccupied with, I was kind of overly, overly conscientious kid, uh, very stressful family circumstance. Uh, and I was kind of channeling all of that into um, a kind of fundamental metaphysical anxiety around hell. So being being Catholic and being told that um, that I had to have blind faith. And at that age, I, I didn't have blind faith. You know, it's that kind of age where kids are starting to question that kind of thing. Um, and, but I, I kind of just out of a, th a fear of this authoritarian God, just wanted to have blind faith just so that he didn't torture me in hell forever. Um, but I couldn't find it. I was just, I don't have it. Like, how do I find this thing I don't have? And there's like, so you've got this benev supposedly benevolent creator God. He's made me without blind faith. He's demanding I have it when I can't have it. I just can't do it. And he's going to punish me for infinity for not having it, but he's benevolent. And he's made me this one. I went around in a loop. I was just like, this doesn't, but, I, I, but my whole being was sunk into this like rumination of just like, I've got to, got to figure it out. Got to figure it out. Like I can't. No, a great ball of I'm doubt, gonna, as they say, a great mass of doubt. Yeah. I, and I remember the, the infinity-ness of hell as a prospect tangibly as a kid, <laughs> you know, not in a good emotional state in terms of my, my, uh, my family life, as I mentioned. So I'm just like, uh, like this is this is important. I need to figure this out, um, and so I was completely absorbed in this. And I realized now I was basically doing. You could say so. I think self inquiry is mm -hmm. all inquiry is basically existential inquiry. You're you're really feeling into what's going on. Like what's what's going on is the. It's not just good Marvin Gaye album. It's uh, it's like uh, the it's the fundamental question that like philosophy and science and and I think this stuff as well is, is really getting at and the uh, so I, I i was really like feeling into it is that what's going on is is there a create supernatural creator god who's going to do this to me and um and through pouring my energy into that there was like a puncturing or the bubble burst of, of thoughts basically um and there was a just a i don't think it could have been deeper in terms of just the absolute dropping away and just the, the complete presence of whatever this is um and the, the total sense Ta -ta -ta, of what i called it yeah. thisness thusness yeah. just such just so -ness, suchness <laughs> exactly just yeah just so -ness. and so um i just remember this like rush of like oh my god like just wanting to kind of shout with joy and just being so just liberated like in you know in that moment and from then on then thoughts came that were like if someone had then said to me, well, what do you think about those priests and stuff? I'd be like, oh, well, obviously they're just telling stories. Like, why should I listen? They're, those ideas, those are thoughts. Like, why would I listen to them? Um, right. So, but I hadn't deduced that intellectually. This wasn't, you know, this was a seeing. And also I hadn't come to some new belief that they were definitely wrong or something. It was just that there'd been a liberation from the thought paradigm. It was just, I was no longer buying into the thought paradigm. It was like, this is here now. This is it, such and suchness. If I'm actually on fire in hell, that's also this suchness, like, and it's all good. It's, it's just, it's all good. Thoroughly perfect, all good for, forever, always. And that was just known really deeply. And then I had a really wonderful, I don't know how long it was, months, years. It felt like a couple of years maybe where of just this kind of abiding. And I remember walking home from school and just being like, this is it. This is the Garden of Eden. We're in it. We've always been in it. We never left. We just had this like veil of ignorance. Um, Weirdly, I was also like very depressed, and so I, I, I'd, I'd love to be able to like feel what my experience was like then, because it was simultaneously amazing, elevated, but also I was having these very depressed periods. Anyway, so then I, I mean, mood is not always correlated with that kind of perceptual right, clarity right, right, about right. Uh, base kind of non-conceptual awareness, right? Um, right? From my own experience, right. I can confirm that. Eventually, in the long run, with practice, um, there's definitely you know positive affect that comes online. Um, as a result of abiding. I mean, that, um, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is but, there was a deep, there was deep, deep, deep positive aspect as part of this, but it was like a, it was like a depressed person who was, I guess, intermittently, who knows, maybe for, maybe for a solid period of time I had that I wasn't depressed. I mean, anyway, w my point is, is that <laughs> it's, it, I wasn't, yeah, I had no sense that I, 
needed to document this or have some, like, you know, it's yeah, sure. so so far in the You didn't feel the urge to go start a cult as a teenager? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah luckily the, the, the phobia of dogmatism and, and, you know, this. so my passion for science and stuff is really, like, about showing you're working out. Instead of being like, just trust me, I'm special. I've had a special experience. It's like, if I'm going to make a claim, I want to be able to to um, tell you why I think it's the case. With the spiritual stuff in the deep end, you know, again, suchness stuff, I can't tell you why it's suchness. And, you know, there aren't, you do run out of ways of explaining things, but um, but you can try your best and be sincere in, in that um, attempt. So, um, yeah, so then as often happens with that kind of initial awakening, it feels so complete. It feels like there's nothing more to to get and if you've you've truly got it and you kind of have really in a sense but it's also true that the ego can fixate on that as a way to avoid going into difficult emotional stuff that's Mm -hmm. necessary to to integrate it so i have a vivid memory of being in my late 20s probably mid 20s and hearing about spiritual bypassing for the first time and being like like that's like a made-up idea because like the absolute is always the absolute (laughs) everything is it's basically just aggressively spiritual bypassing in response to hearing like, like, just, just in my head. I wasn't saying it to anyone, but I, I, I can remember vividly what it feels like to be in the armor of, of spiritual bypassing. And you can't really be touched because your logic is sound in that everything is always the absolute. And there's nothing. Well, yes. Happen. And <laughs> right. And then, but then the, the thing that I, the way I would phrase it now is the thing I said about fixation, that actually there's delusion operating there in the sense that yeah, f- for me, the pro- the path. So I, I got interested in through, psychedelic research interested in whether these kind of psychedelic induced mystical experiences could induce awakening type things in, in people because i thought this was a, just a wonderful it's wonderful to see this aspect of reality um and engage with it and i thought it'd be nice to be able to democratize this and i had hopes uh that maybe this could be like what humanity needs to kind of to get us on a better sure. track than we're currently on now and um and that that hope of like changing the world and stuff faded a lot over time my hopes now are more just if if one individual can suffer a little bit less because if i'm sharing this stuff that's my that's my hopes now um but um but yeah so i i, I tried psychedel- kind of high dose psychedelics myself to see if it was similar very similar but obviously also different phenomenology sure um and mm-hmm. then it it really um unlocked emotion for me basically i um I, I always thought of myself as like a sensitive, like someone who's capable of, you know, open to my feelings or didn't have like a kind of toxic machismo vibe or anything. But I came to realize how deeply emotionally locked up I was and I had extreme somatic tension. Um, and so embodiment, I didn't really understand embodiment before that. I, I remember as a psychology undergrad learning about William James's theory that emotions are first kind of uh physiological patterns that arise in the body, then the brain makes sense of right. them and interprets them. And to me, I was just like, well, he's just made that up. Like emotions happen here. <laughs> like, emotions, like he's just, you may as well say emotions are in your elbow or something like it's, why is he just you know making stuff up? So it, it felt, I felt so mental. Like to me now it's like when people talk about mental health, uh, you know, from the, uh, the paradigm of identifying sure. with thought, to me, it's like, why aren't we talking about emotional health? Like embodied emotional health is what oh, we should yeah, be yeah. talking about. Yeah, yeah. But, but when you're in that paradigm, it just doesn't, yeah. Anyway, so so that kind of uh, allowed me to go into that stuff, and I, I discovered that there was a lot of a lot of trauma that I really had to spend years working through. Um, and then I actually, I thought they were separate projects for a while. I thought I was just okay. I've discovered that I have kind of repressed trauma, and that I'm doing kind of self guided psychedelic intentional psychedelic sessions to um, to process this. And I have the awakening stuff. The awakening's always been the you know this same absolute thing. Like I wasn't really expecting them to converge then they basically did converge and suddenly the last psychedelic trip i have ever done so far a few years ago um i I didn't realize it was the last one at the time uh but i was doing 5 meter dmt therapeutically because i found it kind of allowed me to get to unlock this bodily tension um and this tension in my sternum like dropped and for the next year i guess it was like a dark night of the soul it was like there was just it was like, um, so I, I started really getting to Adyashanti's work because he talks about, he's got a book called The End of Your World, this mm-hmm. kind of, the, 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 the bits of the path people don't like to talk about as much where basically <laughs> you're, you're integrating the realization to a point where it's like, oh, like I'm being, existence is ripping me apart. <laughs> like all of my attachments. <laughs> he talks about waking up in the head, the heart and the gut. And this yeah. was the gut. This was everything yeah. I didn't want to feel. Sure. 
but beyond the beyond the autobiographical, just really fundamental, visceral, you know, like bo- bodily fear of, of of death, pain, rejection, all of all yeah, of these things control, that just have shame, to, yep, like mm-hmm. fear of be, like orientation really, in space, even you know the the, yeah. the urge to take the next breath, all all of that. <laughs> all of that yeah, that, that was a big thing for me, the breath thing. Yeah, so like, and you're just you're in it. There's no way to like you're just you know it's just happening to you. And I, I said to my wife at one point, uh, I was like, it's like I'm excreting myself. Like through, all of <laughs> like and she, I was like, does that make sense? She's like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so maybe that's not the best. Thing. But it's just like oh my body is like it makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. It's like yeah, all, but I guess it's like you're you're go you're you're deepening into authenticity. Is the way I thought about it is like with non-dual realization, like you're you you you, you notice the authentic nature of consciousness, which is, which is that it's non-dual. It's just you know the appearances are what they are. Um, and then this is like, okay, well, what's the authentic nature of my embodied lived experience as a feeling, emotional right. creature? Um, and yeah, and so you go into that, that fundamental flavor of resistance of like no mm-hmm. to life, no to this. Which is that thr- through yeah. the whole body. Right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like, and in my case, yeah, it was really strong tension. And then, um, yeah, then thankfully, <laughs> like the, the, the huge mass of that stuff that felt like it was never, it was, ne- it was like going through a tunnel of... Uh, like trying to escape through a sewer or something, <laughs> like just really wanting to to get out of it. But then the wanting to get out of it is the thing you also have to process because it's about equanimity and not resisting. You're like resisting the the processing your resistance anyway. So um, thankfully that clarified into just kind of um, yeah, kind of more abiding non dual uh, experience. And um, there's still it's like it almost feels like two paradigms at the moment where there's there are periods of, of non-dual clarity and then there appears it's like the self energy just kind of rises up for a little bit and but it's seen and then it relaxes and so moving into that more kind of self-liberating space where there's like oh suffering a bit and then it's like releasing um so yeah my my plan at this point is just keep going with that kind of experiential opening oriented to authenticity um but yeah it's a wild ride when you when you get into that (laughs) stuff Yeah, I mean, um, it's it's interesting for me, you know, with my background in a couple of different Buddhist um, practice lineages where all of this stuff is kind of programmatically laid out um, with mm. sequences and stages and specific practices to hear um, sometimes in, you know, like shocking, like almost identical detail. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I'm not the similar kinds of that, processes yeah. unfolding. But I remember reading in, in um, Daniel Ingram's stuff about working with like disgust and... Uh... Mm-hmm. And stuff like that, which, which in the, in most of the Buddhist stuff I'd seen, I, I didn't see much focus on emotional embodied and this kind of really raw processing stuff. So yeah, I was interested to see that. You'll find it more in um, in Zen, um, in not so much in the koan literature, although that definitely deals with it um, if, if indirectly. Um, more so in like oral instruction in Zen, mm-hmm. um, but you'll find a lot of exactly kind of the stuff you're describing, um, kind of subtle energetic clinging, you know, tanha, right. you know, thirst, right. clinging that's that's in the body. You'll find a lot of that more, you know, explicitly discussed, um, again, within a certain paradigm within um, tantric literature um, and also in, in Dzogchen, um, the great perfection. Right. Um, they have very, very detailed maps and practices for accelerating the release of all of that. Yeah. Yeah. I thought, I thought they'd have more of it probably in the Vajrayana stuff, given like, to, to my mind, like shamanism and stuff like that really gets at this stuff well and then you know i think they have more of that food bond right they have this like integration of that aspect of things um it's in theravada too i i don't want to leave out my theravadan friends and i've done plenty of theravadan practice for them it it happens more through the the you know progressive sequence of absorbed states known as the jhanas and progressing very very deeply through those um that's how you kind of release all of that um embodied tension that way but also also through the process of deconstructive insight meditation it's both but right yeah, and the something that was also useful was um, at certain points where it, you know, so like when you're, like, there's a certain kind of self liberating thing that happens with phenomena as you're doing the kind of absorption, um, and you can imagine you're, you're kind of chipping away at these things over, kind of slowly without going deep into them. But I found that there were certain points where focusing on a specific belief that I was attached to, a really juicy belief, like. You know, something I started playing around with was just the belief that I have a life, that like there is a, you know, because like, <laughs> I, I, I knew that 
I kind of knew like, okay, James isn't, there isn't a self, right? So, so if I was like, okay, there isn't a self, there is no, you know, James, that didn't land in the same way, but actually the subtle sense of self was attached to the kind of, you know, it's like whispering the James pub is like James's life. Like there is something there mm-hmm. that I'm invested there's in. There's a narrative arc. Yeah. There's a narrative arc and I'm not, and the, the thing isn't to then kind of swing the other way and say, I now have the belief that James doesn't have a life. You do get some teachers who will say, you know, this, there is no person. It is only timeless point. awareness. Exactly. Like, <laughs> you know, they have the new belief that you don't have a life. And I'm not saying that, but, it, but really feeling into like, it kind, of, kind of inquiry, like looking, looking in this moment, can I find my life? I genuinely can't. I can, you know, I've never found an experience in my life. Um, and then feeling it slipping away and like letting feeling all the anxieties of what if I were to lose my life? Like not, I don't mean death. I mean like that narrative arc mm-hmm. and like, and then you get into like all your personal relationships. What if, I mean, if the, yeah, this is, this is what I was saying about kind of getting brutal where you start to be like, what if I were to lose my, my, you know, all of my loved ones in different ways and really mm-hmm. authentically feeling that or feeling like, what if I was going to be executed tonight and stuff like, just like mm-hmm. really going into all that resistance. Um, but yeah, I felt, I felt that, 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 intentionally focusing on beliefs was was useful and that's not something i'd found in in buddhist practices because like, because of, of the kind of phenomenological present moment thing this felt more like a cognitive really investigating yeah i mean you'll f- you navigate through the world if you're in a monastery, in contemporary you don't have that same narrative arc thing going yeah i mean that that if you're on a monastic schedule that'll definitely break that down <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, and it depends on the Buddhist practice lineage as well. Some do, uh, you know, the Dalai Lama sect, for instance, they, you know, they go through like rigorous kind of analytical meditations where they, they, mm. they, you know, they, they break everything right, down right. <laughs> really yeah. systematically, um, through study and, yeah. and then also bringing that into meditative practice. Um, yeah. you know, I mean, one thing that I'm trying to do is like make people more aware of like the huge array and diversity of, um, contemplative pedagogies that exist right. because what is represented in popular culture is really just a small fraction, um, of the wealth that exists within, um, a whole bunch of different traditions. I'm most familiar with Buddhism, but yeah, it's, it's, it makes you think, so like, I, I feel like I'm in conversations with a lot of, alongside lots of kind of Buddhist modernists, people who want to secularize and naturalize Buddhism. And I really come to, I don't come to this through Buddhism. You know, I came to it through, through the awakening and then see, seeking to integrate it and seeking to understand how it fits with science. Um, and so part of, I guess my passion is like, like I've had people in the past, like ask, how do we, how do people not do this in like an appropriative way and stuff? And the thing to me is always like, this is, I'm talking about reality like this, like what you are. <laughs> I'm not talking about like learning ideas from a particular culture and then like, and so, um, uh, to me, at least, yeah, it's like it, it kind of sidesteps those concerns. And, and I look to Buddhism as a particularly well-formed philosophical tradition, like that really, like, has a lot to offer. Uh, kind of out of respect, like, like as an academic, like citing, you know, people who have gone before you who have made big contributions. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to raise that because I, I don't see my, you know, myself as that educated in Buddhism, um, as my musings on this may have may have <laughs> shown. Uh, no, I mean, in, in some sense, that's 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 um, valuable, right? If you if you come to this not through any particular, um, you know, established tradition, you know, you you have a unique perspective and a, a way in and a view on it for that reason. You know, mind. I'm, uh, yeah, 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 really. Um, I mean, I can speak from my own experience that, uh, you know, obsessive study of all of this stuff, you know, um, dusty texts and maps and models um, can get in the way as much as it can help. And inspire, but, um, but yeah, seriously, I mean, I'm definitely not not suggesting one superior to the other because I I've, I've really enjoyed yeah like diving into your stuff and then the sharing of those models and things. So it's um, yeah, it was more just an interesting thought that arose rather than uh, making claims about what's better or worse. Yeah, I mean, and and also, yeah, I'm you know I'm, I'm full time teaching these days, and for most people, I'm like yeah, the, you know the, the maps. Uh, ugh, if you find them in, inspiring, great, um, and otherwise, you know, minimal viable scaffolding, just practice. <laughs> Yeah, the, I like that. I mean, was, the word lean always comes out of the way I approach stuff. Is I, I really want to find like what's the lean, like what's the minimal amount of stuff you need to do this because there's so much fluff and kind of not so much kind of Buddhist stuff, but like contemporary spirituality where it gets really like the kind of stuff that's prevalent on like TikTok and Instagram, talking about sure. aliens and just all that kind of thing. Like there's so much egoic fluff of like that kind of comes off of this process that's that's the thing i have the phobia to do that i'm just like because because it's like 
some people, I think some people can turn to meditation because they, they really don't want to do the emotional work and they think if I just mm -hmm. stick with the awareness, it kind of allows a, a bypassing. So, so then you can get the impression, oh, is, is emotion work in the, in the fluff? Is that in the stuff you actually don't need to do? <laughs> can I put, so can, like, can I throw that away too? <laughs> can I just not do that? Yeah. Is that like aliens? Like emotions actually, you know, it's just a silly thing to believe in. <laughs> um, uh, not folks, like, yeah. not. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, is there anything that we did not cover um, that you would like to in, you know, a little, uh, we usually go about an hour. So. Yeah, I, I think we've, we've covered stuff. Well, um, the, I, at one point I was going to try and explain uh, kind of why it is that I think life living things have to be conscious. I kind of gestured towards it, um, mm -hmm. but, but it's quite like, the way I was going to do that it might be technical involved in technical in a way that I'm, I'm feeling like I'd probably be crowbarring it in now. So maybe I'll save that for, yeah, for maybe, maybe, maybe um, you can let folks know if they want to know your, your more elaborated views, of course, by the book, but if, is there any video it, yeah. or text, uh, that, you know, uh, for now that people can, I can point them to, I will be launching. So I'll be kind of, uh, the book is now available for pre-order. I guess this, this may be me announcing it for the first time because <laughs> I've not announced right. it officially on my own channels. So I'll be releasing stuff on that soon. So go to my YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Dr. James Cook. Uh, and there's also drjamescook.com. Uh, but I'm also, I'm at Dr. James Cook on all my, uh, social media channels, you know, Twitter and, um, and so, yeah, just following that is the way you, where you'll see me sharing everything. I'm sure there'll be lots of promotional stuff over the coming months. So uh, lots of chances to, to see if I'm, you know, talking nonsense or not. <laughs> well, you made perfect uh, sense to me. Well, um, you know, I mean, some of the scientific detail I'm fam only familiar with in, in broad strokes, but made all made sense to me. Um, but we'll, we'll let the audience decide whether, whether it made sense to them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Well, thank you everybody for tuning in and listening. I hope it, the conversation was, was useful to you. Um, I certainly enjoyed it. Um, James, is there anything you'd like to send people off with? Just thank you to everyone for listening. And yeah, and thank you to you. This has been, this has been really enjoyable. Okay, great. Take care folks. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. If you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. And if you want to help the podcast reach a wider audience, you can leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Finally, if you want to offer financial support, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Dr. James Cook.